Okay, what's good ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my first breakdown of the year for UFC Fight Night 217 Strickland vs. Imavov, uh, contested at the UFC Apex in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, I've just finished watching this card, and holy fuck, what a solid card this was to start off the year. It's 3 a.m. here, so I'm not going to play around. I'm just going to get straight into the action. Okay, so the first fight on the card was an early prelim bout at 125 pounds. This was contested between Charles Energy, I know, Johnson, and Jimmy the Brick Flick. In, uh, for me, it was just the battle of the UFC's shittest nicknames. Now, I didn't make a breakdown of the fight um, in my card breakdown because I didn't really care about it. However, based on his win against Zalgas, I stuck Johnson into one of my parlays, despite the city name and I don't know what the fuck that is on the back of his head. It looks like a massive soul patch or something. But anyway, um, I stuck Johnson into a parlay. And he actually won this one by a TKO in the first round by ground and pound. And it was a really, really nice fight to start the card. Uh, very enjoyable back and forth. Flick did look like he was, you know, he was somebody who was, I believe he'd retired at some point and he hadn't been in the cage for two years. And it did kind of show, um, you know, the fight started really well. Both men didn't really take any time to warm up. They started exchanging really nasty leg kicks. Uh, Flick basically went for an early takedown and got immediately reversed, and that kind of set the tone. Uh, Johnson was able to apply a few shots in that situation, avoid some submissions, which is where Flick is the most dangerous. Now, the fight didn't really stay on the floor long, and we got back to the feet pretty quickly. Johnson then really started to get the upper hand then. He was peppering with body shots. He managed to wobble Flick. Um, he hit him with a right and then a head kick. Uh, then Flick managed to get another takedown. He got instantly reversed again. And then Johnson just started pounding away with vicious elbows and shots on the ground. And the ref called it off. And at the time, I felt like it was a little bit of an early stoppage. But uh, Flick can't really complain. He was bloodied up. He didn't look like he had an avenue to win anyway. So it's probably just best that it ended there and then. It was, a, it was a nice win from the Soul Patch, and it was a really nice post-fight speech, actually. He spoke about being a girl daddy, which is a term I've never heard before. Uh, but it was a nice win, and a, a really nice fight to start the card, as I said. And yeah, we move on to the next fight in the card. Now, the next one was contested between Dan Argueta and... Nick Aguirre, I believe it's how you pronounce that, I could be wrong. Now, I didn't touch this one in a parlay, as I've only seen these children fight once, and I didn't talk about it in my pre-fight um, breakdown. But I was quite intrigued by this one. Uh, so the fight started off a little bit more reserved. Uh, Argueta gave him a really nasty leg kick. Um, Argueta brings him to the edge of the cage and takes him down pretty easily. He started applying like nasty elbows and shots on the ground. Um, Argueta then threw up a submission attempt at around the three minute mark and Aguirre manages to reverse it and get a body lock triangle position on the floor. Now, one thing I hate about fighters that do this is he got like a really good position, but he basically did nothing with it. He just like you know, stuck in the, the triangle lock and just kind of sat there. And when you when you hear me referring to laying and praying, that's basically what I'm what I'm talking about. Uh so he laid and prayed at him at him locked in for a few minutes and then the fight ends up back on the feet. Argueta looked obviously really busy, just making sure he didn't want to lose the round. Um pushed him up to the cage, had some nice clench work. He then managed another easy takedown and locked up his own triangle lock on the floor. So um, that kind of made it a very clear round for him. Round two was very similar. Argueta mixing up shots and throwing in clinch work, threw in a takedown. Uh, he tried to apply a rear naked choke. Now, Aguirre did really well to kind of fight the hands. 
and and prevent the submission. But again, it just made it another clear round. Um, Argueta then started the final round looking a little bit gassed, and that might be something to look look out for in his fights going forward. Aguirre again tries to come in swinging, but gets taken down. And that's basically how the round ended. I had this as an easy 3-0. It wasn't the most entertaining of fights. But the judges called it the same. 3-0 uh, across the board. Um, as I said, Argueta's gas tank is a little concerning. And I'm going to consider that as a very serious factor in his next fight. It was a decent win. And, you know, considering that I didn't put a um, a prediction done for this fight, I remain 1-0 one and, one and at the moment, so... Good fight. Well, good enough fight. Um, it took a little bit of the steam out of the first one, but not a terrible fight by any means. Now, the next fight was between Alan Nascimento and Carlos Hernandez. Um, now, this is one I didn't break down, but at the end of the last of the preview cards, I picked Na uh, Nascimento as an honorable mention, and I put him into my safe parlay. Um... Now, this one got straight into action. Nascimento took control of the center immediately. Hernandez tried to catch him with a few glancing blows, but he couldn't do anything to kind of stop Nascimento pulling him down and taking his back. And this is really not where Hernandez wanted the fight to be. Really a nightmare start for him. Uh, now, now, as we know, or as I mentioned in the last card, uh, Alan Nascimento is coming out of uh, Shute Box, which is the gym where Charles Oliveira fights. And his style really showed. There was that confidence on the feet, but ultimately the whole, you know, if I get you down to the ground, this thing is over. And that's basically where the fight went. He locked in a body triangle. Um, Carlos managed to get back up to his feet, but by then it was academic. He was too far locked in. He ended up remaining on the back, sort of, Backpack style, uh, locked in a rear naked choke, and he forced Hernandez to tap. Um, I've got to give Hernandez some credit. He did do his best to survive. Like, he was getting choked the fuck out. And you could see he really, really tried his best to get out of it. I've noticed in a lot of fights recently, the Darren Till one kind of stood out to me in particular, where he literally, you know, tapped in less than a second. Fair play to Hernandez. He really, really tried to you know, resist um, tapping. So that pretty much brought me up to 2-0. and oh. So good start to the card, 2-0 and oh up. I'm pretty proud of that start. And this took us on to... Now, I had it pronounced Rebecca. Um, I noticed that in the build-up, it was being pronounced as Re Ren Becky. But I don't give a fuck. It's Rebecca. Um, so it was Rebecca and Fior at 155. Now, I picked this one to go under 1.5 rounds, and my belief was that Fior was going to get knocked the fuck out. Uh, mainly because Fior has never seen the second round. And even though he's undefeated going into this, and, you know, he fights at the New England Cartel, which is a very small team, but has some really good fighters in Qatar and Rob Font there. It was a it was an interesting pick to make and it it kind of came undone for me as you're gonna find out here. So as expected, um Renbeksky, as it's pronounced, um he started things he came out swinging like a retard. That's all I can say. Um just like I thought he would. He looked really, really blown up for a lightweight, and this seemed to be a really dangerous tactic to me. Now the thing is he was doing damage. And Fior was essentially just playing very defensive. You know, uh, Rebensky uh, mixed up some strikes well in the rounds. He had some really notable shots to the body, which I always like to see. I think it's always a good idea to invest in the body. Uh, so he was mixing up strikes. Um, at one point, Fior actually managed to slip one through and he cut Rebecca just above the eye. Rebensky, sorry. Then managed to get him down and... Then, sorry, Rebensky then managed to take him down and do some damage of his own. So it was a really close round, but you could see that Rebensky had used up quite a lot of energy. And I instantly thought, uh, I've got a pick for this to go on the 1.5. And I could tell at that moment that it was going to be unlikely. And, you know, that turned out to be the case. Um, round two and three essentially played out with 
both men, to be fair, looking pretty gassed. And Rebetsky winging shots. Getting world world time takedowns, I think, at moments are what really won him the fight. Because he basically managed to pull those off in moments when he looked like he was really gassing. And that's always the sign of a fighter who has a pretty decent IQ in there. He had dominant control time. He did significant damage. But, you know, Fior was tougher than I expected. And he managed to hang on to the end. Uh, uh, this was a tougher fight than I expected in general. But, you know, Rabensky looks like a pretty dangerous guy at this weight class. I think if I'm going to be picking him going forward, especially some of the better guys in the division, he's going to have to learn how to how to control his gas tank a bit better because if he does that against anyone in the top 10, he's going to get choked out in the second round. Um, but, you know, it was a decent performance. It didn't finish the way I was expecting, but picked him to win. So this moved me to 3-0 and and I'm buzzing at this point. I'm thinking, great start. It's only going to get better from here, I'm thinking. So the next fight was the middleweight fight between Ribeiro and Al Hassan. Now I picked in my build up. I basically said that one of these guys is getting knocked the fuck out, and that's exactly what happened. Um, but what I did say is I did slightly edge Ribeiro, just because I I strongly believed it was going to end before one point five. Now to be honest, like when I was watching the pre-fight highlights and I saw. You know, Ribeiro goofball dancing his way to the uh, to the cage. And then he had this weird pep talk by a very strange tattooed fingered woman. I suddenly got very nervous about my pick. Uh, a pick that I wasn't that confident to begin with anyway. So anyway, Ribeiro starts the first round out really nicely. He whips some really brutal leg kicks. And he was kind of staying away at range. And Al Hassan was doing exactly what I expected him to do. He was loading up and trying to swing like a cartoon character. Um, Al Hassan surprised me here, though, by going in for a takedown. Now it got stuffed, but the fact that he went for one was very important for me in this fight. You know, it gave. You could see it kind of shock, shocked Ribeiro. He wasn't expecting that, and I think that led to what happened later on in the fight. But anyway, at that point, um, Al Hassan manages to break. Ribeiro goes back to the leg. Um, As uh, Al Hassan is then controlling him pretty well against the cage. There's a few leg kicks coming in, which Al Hassan's making no attempt to to evade. And then up towards the end of the round, Al Hassan kind of pins Ribeiro up against the fence and hits some really nice knees to the thigh, um, and finishes the few round by hitting a few nice shots to edge the round. So I basically had it was a close round, but I had Al Hassan up one zero. Now, round two, again, we had more legwork from uh, Ribeiro. And he takes to the center and he starts swinging really wildly, looking for a big KO, which maybe was an indication of what I alluded to earlier, that he was he was a bit tired, like fighting off those takedowns, maybe gassed him out a little bit. And I did mention in the pre-fight build-up that I felt like his gas tank could be a problem because he's a guy who usually finish, finishes fights early. Now, now, this was a few seconds into the fight. Al Hassan stayed patient. Ribeiro comes in, you know, swinging like a helicopter. And uh, Al Hassan stayed patient. He kind of ducked, you know, dropped the shoulder a little bit and just hit him with an absolute bomb, which just put him down. And at this weight class, you get hit like that. Your goose is cooked, mate. It's over. Now, so I got the 1.5 correct. And I did indicate to... I'm glad really that I indicated to everyone not to bet on this one, not to bet on the winner for this one. So I did get the one under 1.5 correct, but I did edge Ribeiro. So that took me to three to one on the card. However, this was a decent scrap, um, a brutal battering finish, which was a really nice, you know, it's, it's always nice to see a finish. And I suspect that we'll see Ribeiro given another chance. You know, it was a very decent performance. And it was nice to see Al Hassan with a new wrinkle in his game. You know, at his age, going for a takedown. It wasn't a great type takedown, but to come in with a little bit of a different game plan was refreshing to see. And I, I very much appreciated that. So that bodes well for him moving forward for whatever left he's got of his career. It was a nice fight. Okay, now this was one I was really looking forward to. It was a scrap between um, Javid Basharat, who recently moved to Team Couture, as I mentioned, and Mateus Mendonca. 
uh, also pronounced, it's meant pronounced Mendonce, but I don't feel too comfortable saying that. So again, I'm going with Mendonca. Now, both these guys are really good prospects. So I was very much looking forward to this one. I picked this one to go over 2.5 and for Javid to get the nod. So let's see how this one played out. Now, Mendonce started his first, started first off as the aggressor. He swung with a few head kicks and wild exchanges. Exchanges. Uh, he had the best moment early on in the fight I, by putting Javid down with a, like he kicked his leg really hard and put him down. So I think that would have been taken as a knockdown. I'm not sure explicitly what the rules are on that, but I believe you know that would have been counted as a as a as a knockdown. Um, and he got he, he kind of hit him with a nice shot that wobbled him and. You know, he looked look he looked pretty good. Um, but as I predicted, Javid started to really mix it up at this point. And it was the shots to the body and a few sprawls, like stuffing a few takedowns and reversing position that really started to change the tone of this fight. Uh, there were a few nice exchanges between the two. Uh, Javid secured another takedown and then he saw out the round really nicely. Um, now, Mendonk, Mendonk, Mendonts. I mean, donks, whatever you want to perform it, uh, pronounce it as. Um, he made this really wacky, like, cartwheel attempt that really made me laugh out loud. Uh, it was so weird, such a strange thing to do. Um, just really wacky. But it was a clear round for Javid. Now, in round two, this is when Javid really started to take over. He had some really good um, striking defense. He slipped in and out, and he was landing nice shots. Now, there was a call at some point in the fight for a contentious eye poke, but the replays weren't really clear on it. I had a good look myself, and it didn't look like it didn't look like an eye poke. Uh, Javid spent the, you know a great part of the round on top. He put on some really good ground and pound. You could make an argument for a 10-8. However, I think the submission attempt at the end from Mendonks made it another 10-9. So I'd say a 10-9 was safe for Javid. And... This really left Mendonks with a, a mountain to climb. Now, the third round was a lot closer. Um, both men exchanged a little bit more at times, but again, Javid was hitting the cleaner strikes. He really managed the distance well, and he did exactly what I expected him to do. He mixed up the strikes. He was going to the head, to the body, and I think it was the body shots that really did the damage here. Mendonks was getting increasingly desperate as the fight wore on. And it ended up with Javid actually on top, looking for finish, looking for a finish with ground and pound. He ended up securing the unanimous decision one win, sorry, with one judge giving a round to Mendonks, which for me was a little cheeky, I'll be honest. But it was a really good win. It was a UD, which was the right call. It went exactly as I called it. So this took me up to 4-1 on the card, and I still had, you know, two pretty decent parlays still left in place. So I was pretty happy. Um, uh, Javid then called out Gutierrez, which for me is a very, very risky call out. If you're going to pick out, pick anyone in the top 15, I'd say Javid probably has the best fight against him. So I've got mad respect for him for, for taking Gutierrez. Cause I think Gutierrez's last fight was against, uh, he was the, it was the retirement fight for Frankie Edgar and he fucking destroyed him. You know, if I'm, I know Frankie Edgar's on, you know, he was on the way out and, but, you know, that, that's a dangerous fight. But respect for, for, for that call out. Okay. So we now jump to the main card with the opening fight between Umar and Rayoni Barcelos. I picked Umar to win by second round ground and pounds. Uh, but the fight to go over 1.5 rounds. Uh, Barcelos is a tough little prick. So we'll see how this played out. Now, holy shit. This was a really good performance. It was probably Umar's best. He was incredibly patient in this one. He was mainly testing Barcelos, Barcelos from range again, using teeps and leg kicks. Barcelos was actually looking pretty good for most of the round. He was chipping away with leg kicks. He landed a few crosses. Uh, so this was playing out exactly as I said it would. You know, there was patient displays from Umar. Rayoni was starting to get comfortable. He was looking good. Then out of nowhere, towards the end of the round, Umar throws this kind of, it was the most awkward shit I've ever seen, but, you know, fair play. He kind of throws a knee and then a kind of a, just a cheeky, like, sort of snap left. 
and it just sent Barcelos to 99. Like, he just went crashing. Uh, even Umar looked surprised. So the finish happened around earlier than I was expecting. And it looked competitive until it suddenly wasn't. But it was a very impressive win. And I hope we get to see Umar against the top 10 opponent. Because this, this was reaching down for me. Uh, so a very strange one. But again, it's another person with a really good winning record that Umar can now put on his on his resume. Uh, and he had a really... It, this put me up to 5-1. So I was thinking, I'm a genius. There's nothing can go wrong here. I'm I'm flying. You know, and also there was a... Umar's post-fight speech was quite funny. Like, he admitted he had no idea how he finished the fight. He wasn't aware of how the sequence went. And, like, it was it was quite funny. And he then said, in, there was no call-out at the end of the fight, but he basically said, I want top 10. I'm willing to fight anyone. anyone. You know, and to be, he's a dangerous he's a dangerous guy. And he's probably my favorite Dagestani in the UFC anyway. Um, nice technical display. And a really nice fight to get the main card kicked off. Okay, next up was the what turned out to be the only women's fight on the card due to the cancellation of Priscilla Cacuera and Sejara Eubanks. And so this was contested between Vieira and Pennington in the deep as a puddle bantamweight division. Now, I pussied out here a little bit and I picked this fight to go by decision. And I said it would be a contentious win for Vieira. So let's see this. Let's see what happened. Now, by the way, if I'd managed to win this one, I would have ended the card with a positive record regardless of what happens after. So I kind of resisted the urge to take a toilet break or like nap through on this one. And I really paid close attention. Um, now, this was a strange one for me in a lot of ways, but I'll quickly get into why the fight started out. Now, it it was pretty wild with Vieira like gaining the advantage in the early exchanges. And this kind of surprised me. Um, as the fight went on, or as the round went on, Rocky had some really good shots to the body and was starting to, but you know, she was starting to get caught more at range. Uh, so the fight started out really well, you know, very, very well, you know, for a woman's fight. Um, Rocky got cut early and took the more significant strike. So to me, that was clearly a Vieira round. Like, she had the far better strikes. She did the clear and most visible damage. And Pennington looked a little bit shell-shocked. And I was thinking, oh, like, maybe I got this one wrong. And Vieira's just better and she's going to coast through to a decision here. And that's how it's going to go. So she clearly took round one. and But it was, yeah, it was a clear round. Nothing contentious about that. Now, round two was where the fight began to swing. Um, Rocky began changing the game plan, which I thought was really clever. She didn't start rushing in like a mongoloid. Like, she took her time. She started picking more careful shots and having some really good success. And Vieira started to look a little worn out. And she kind of got saved somewhat when her Rocky gave her a mistimed nut, uh, shot to the nuts. So Vieira took a minute or two to tuck her balls back in and get some much needed rest. And then what proceeded then for the rest of the round was a lot of clinching and knees. They, you know, there was a Muay Thai clinch. They were both kind of giving each other nice little knees to the stomach. Um, I think Rocky evened up the fight in this round. I think it was 1-1. But this was a much less convincing round than the first. So at this point, I'm feeling, yeah, I'm spot on at this one. I'm thinking, shit, I should have called this channel the M like MMA Nostradamus or something. I was thinking, I'm a genius. Like, this is all going well. Fuck bad MMA math. This is all good. Now, then we go to round three. And this is where it started to get... Uh, I'll be honest, this, this one is where it kind of fucked up for me. Um, now, to be honest, I gave this one to Fie to Vieira. But it was pretty close. You know, Rocky started out really busy. But I felt Vieira was landing the better shots. She initiated a clinch. She kept her against the cage. She perhaps wasn't as busy as she could have been, but she was the only one doing work. And she managed to get the back at some point and was hitting a few shots, which for me edged her around. Um, so now... I said this fight was going to go the distance, and it did. I also said the fight would be a split decision, which is a difficult call to make, and it was. To be honest, though, I thought what was going to happen is that Pennington was going to win the third round, 
and that Vieira was going to win the fight contentiously. But the reverse basically ended up happening where I felt Vieira had the better third round, but Pennington was given a nod. So while it's, I wouldn't exactly call it a robbery because that's a bit, you know, that's a bit harsh. But I have to, I have to give myself an L for this one as close as it was. So this brought me to 5-2. But I'm really satisfied of how I called this one. So I'm, I'm sat there, I'm thinking, I still need one out of the next three to ensure a winning record on my first card. And I must admit that I'm starting to feel a little nervous at this point. Because, as I said in my fight breakdown, I had very little confidence in the next three coming up. And, yeah. It, it just, uh, yeah, like, let's just say I was getting nervous at this point. So the next fight was what I thought was a really potential and, you know, a potential barn burner between Kopilov and Soriano. Now, I picked Soriano to edge the decision on this one. And boy, was I wrong on this one. Now, I did add some caveats to that when I was making my prediction. I said that what I hoped was that with Soriano spending more time at um, KOTOR, that he was going to try and adapt a lot more of a patient style and that he wasn't going to come swinging in like a fucking moron. Um, and he did exactly what I thought he wouldn't be stupid enough to do. And he started swinging like, a, again, just wildly, swinging his arms around like a four-year-old in a playground. He was missing shots. Um, he went for an early takedown. So I was initially encouraged. I was thinking, oh, like, maybe he is going to, you know, change the game plan a little bit, be a bit patient, show, a, show like a very game. But Kopilov just stayed patient. He started working a few leg kicks. And this gave him time to find his range. And then once he started establishing that jab and just popping it out, that's what really made the difference in this one. He kept distance. He kept popping that jab. And it was so effective um, it just, and you know, you just saw Puna swinging and missing. It was becoming clear that he was gassing out. And then he pulled another desperate takedown, which was really badly stuffed. So I had Kopilov like clearly winning the first. Now, the second round was very much the same with Kopilov, Kopilov just using the jab to control. Really smartly switching it up, targeting the body. Puna Heli, to be fair to him, he really fought like a warrior and he stayed standing, you know, despite some nice shots. He even managed to land some really close uppercut, uppercuts and did some really nice dirty boxing on the inside. But eventually it was the shots to the, the shots to the stomach. He just took one shot too many and you could just see him crumbling with um, and then Kopilov just eventually gave him one dirty boot to the stomach. And, you know, this it resulted in basically a standing finish. You know, he was done. He was out on his feet and brilliant performance from Kopilov. I think it's a shame for Puna, but, you know, with a fight IQ like this, and I did state that I was worried because his fight with um, Nick Maximov, boy, uh, Nick Maximov turned out to be not very good at all. And this a very similar thing happened to Puna in that fight. So I think with fight IQ like this, he's going to be a middle carder at best. And I think he'll be kept around because the UFC likes having guys that fucking swing like nutcases. Um, and, you know, you pair them up with equally stupid fighters and you tend to get, it's an exciting fight that you can have in the card. So it was a good win for Kopilov and this took me to five and three. So I could feel the worm was turning at this point, but yeah, good fight and very enjoyable. So I'm always happy to take an L if the fight was good and it wasn't a total robbery and this was not that. So the next fight was let's see it was dan ige versus damon jack i just realized that i've i accidentally skipped the puna heli um screen card here but i'm, I'm gonna truck on anyway um so we got we get to the co-main event now which was yeah i was enjoying talking too much and uh i didn't add the slide in anyway um we finally get to the co-main event, and this was Jackson versus Ige, which, um, again, I really struggled to come to a conclusion with. I was going back and forth on this all week. Now, in my pre-fight predictions, I I picked Jackson to win by a relatively close decision, and 
I instantly regretted this about five seconds into the fight. Um, now it start the fight started out basically how it ended up finishing. Like Jackson came in looking really sloppy. He is so horrible on the feet, and he he mentioned this very clearly at the beginning. You know, in the build up to the fight, he was like, "Look, Dan Ige is much better on the feet." I'm the kind of guy to take it to the ground. So that's what I need to do to win it. And what does he do? He tries to have a stand-up fight with Dan Ige. You know, these are the things of somebody's predictions and bad MMA math. You know, it's like sometimes, you know, game plans just go right out the window because these fighters get too hyped up. They get lost in the moment. They forget the game plan. And it results in stupid things happening in the cage and this is exactly what happened now i don't even know if it, it would have mattered one way or another because to be fair um despite the knockdown being a precursor for what to, what came um Ige took control of the sensor he was patient patiently picking his shots um now jackson after getting outworked and out out fight out fought in the first three or four minutes um he finally woke the fuck up and went for a takedown, but it got really, really easily stuffed. And I think this is where the fight was definitively over for me. Uh, Ige then opened the bump with two really nasty uppercuts, which were wrong wrongfully called as an eye poke, by the way. So Jackson managed to get like a two minute, like, you know, recovery time from that. And he was having some moments of success, but, you know, Ige ended the round with a nice shot that wobbled him. And he even ended the round with a nicely timed takedown of his own. So I, I was pretty, it was pretty much academic at this point that this was going to be over. So round two starts. It was a little better for Jackson, who, again, some unknown reason, elected to keep it on the feet. He managed to skirt around fa fairly well and rally off a few shots in the first few minutes without really doing any significant damage. But at about the two-minute mark, if I recall, uh, Ige landed the most significant shot of the fight right on the forehead, which instantly drew blood. And this basically impaired Jackson's vision even more. Now, Jackson did manage to rally with a few nice combos, but his desperation was becoming obvious. And as he stepped in once more with just, again, shockingly bad timing, he got caught with a vicious left walk-off KO. Now, walk-off KO is where somebody smacks you and they know they've hit you so well that they don't even, you know, continue to finish you off. They just walk off knowing that the fight is done and it, it always looks cool on a highlight reel. Um, so this made it worthy of a performance bonus for me. I thought Ige was... He fought a brilliant fight. Um, and it was clear to me that Jackson has reached his ceiling here. You know, he won't be contesting in the top 15 of the division. Um, this took me to five and four, but with a great card so far and a few contentious decisions, you know, well, only one contentious decision, really. I've got no complaints at this. I felt like I could have been six and three at this point, but I'm happy to take five and four with the women's fight going the way that it did. Really nice post-fight speech from Ige. Speech from Ige. You could see how much it meant, meant to him. He didn't call anyone out, but you could see that he was... Um, like I said, the fight meant a lot to him. Now, this was... This was the tricky one for me because... And the most risky. Uh, and this was the main event fight between Strickland and Imavov. Now, as we know... or Well, going into it, now, in picking it with both these two men, if they both had had full fight camps, I would have been so confident in picking Strickland on this one. I would have had no doubts. My um, initial breakdown of it would have been so much more convincing. But he only took this on a few weeks' notice, and this was even less than a few weeks' notice. It was maybe eight, nine days' notice. So this was harder to call. Um, on paper, however, this was potentially a much better main event than the Gastelum fight that was supposed to take place with Amavov. So I was pretty excited for this one. Now, everyone was picking Imavov to win this fight. And I decided again, you know, to be a bit of a contrarian. And I picked Sean Strickland to win this one. And I said he would win it 
by decision. So now my initial feelings when this fight kicked off was that it looked very similar to the fight when uh, Strickland got absolutely flatline KO'd by Alex Pereira, the guy who beat uh, Israel Adesanya recently. Um, he was just coming forward like a zombie again. And I'm, I was thinking, oh man, he's going to get fucking chinned. And for the first few minutes, that seemed like a genuine danger. But then Sean started becoming a lot more careful. He was slipping shots more. He was starting to work the body, which is always an encouraging sign to me. And by the end of the round, despite, you know, the first half of the fight, he was, or first half of the round, he was quite down in significant strikes. But by the end of the first round, he'd managed to equalize it. He was controlling the center. And you could see he was starting to turn it into his kind of fight. You know, just a straight up boxing fight. And Imamov looked very uncomfortable. So at the start of round two, just before he got off the bench, you could see Imamov was blowing really hard and he looked really rattled coming off the stool. And one thing that stood out in the fight for me was when you looked at the corners in between each round, Sean was standing and looking like really eager to get back out there. It's like he didn't want to rest. And Imamov was sat down on the stool looking like frazzled. He was like, what's up with this weirdo? Like, what, what's he doing? Like, he looked confused. Um... So at this point in round two, this is when the fight really started to, you know, tip in Sean's favor. He started like teeping more to the body, which I really like teeps. I think they're so underrated in the um, in the MMA game. But what really got me jumping out of my seat, or in this case, falling out of my beanbag, uh, more accurately, was when Strickland nailed a takedown right in the middle of the second. It was so beautifully timed. And if you know... You know, all of you that are listening to this video who I've um, spoken to about MMA quite a lot, I'm flabbergasted with Strickland a lot of the time and the fact that he refuses to use what is such a strong strength for him. So to see him and the way he timed it, I was like, fuck yes, like finally. Um, so he nailed a beautiful tight takedown. And then the fight was firmly in Strickland's domain from that point onwards. And rather than go through it round by round, because it's, you know, I'm realized I've talked quite a bit here and I don't even know how long the video is. It could be over half an hour by an hour or even longer. Um, I think what there were three things that won Sean Strickland this fight. And it was the teeth to the body. It, and it uh, By winning the fight, I mean, he clearly won the first four rounds for me. It was the teething to the body. It was the fact that he was constantly moving forward. So he was giving Imamov no time to settle. And then when it looked like Imamov was coming out and starting to gain a little bit more and looked like he was letting the hands go, Sean Strickland would clinch at the perfect time and either push him up against the cage or just hold him in tight and let things settle down before taking back control and swinging again. It was the... If you've never seen Sean, Sean, uh, Sean Strickland fight, this was a quintessential Strickland performance in the... He kept it at boxing range. It was nice to have the takedown thrown in, as I said. Played a really good clinch game. And he made Imamov fight his fight. And it became very clear that it was going to go Strickland's way. So I said this would go five rounds. And despite being laughed at by numerous people, it went five rounds. And I also said that Strickland would pay out as the underdog, which he also did. So I ended up with a respectable 6-4 and some really accurate pred predictions. Um, the Vieira one was the one I was the most unlucky with. Um, and I felt that, you know, you know, really call calling that a split decision and saying how the fight would play out, which it did to an exact T, 7-3 would have been fair. But generally the judging was really clean and... It was a really good, solid card to start the year. So I'm delighted about that. So um, I end with a, like I said, a respectable 6-4. Now keep tuned later for the week when I'll be breaking down the pay-per-view card, which will be Glover Teixeira versus Jamal, Jamahal Hill. So until then... Uh, for anyone listening, have a great one. And uh, thanks for tuning in so long. It's much appreciated. And thanks for all the feedback that you guys have been giving me. It's really been helpful. And it's, it's starting to get a lot more fun now. So thanks a lot.
anyway, as I said, have a great one and uh, see you in a bit.